In the study of theology, there's one word that, when it is spoken, often strikes terror in the souls of the faint-hearted, and that word is the word predestination. I know whenever the subject comes up at the seminary where I teach, the students think that it's the most juicy and delicious of all theological subjects, and it has a tendency to uh, evoke instant controversy and debate. And we're going to look briefly in this session at this concept of predestination, but before I do that, I want to give one word of caution. I think that the doctrine of predestination is difficult, and it causes a great deal of perplexity and bewilderment whenever it is discussed and whenever it is studied. And it's a, que it's a, a question that requires, I think, not only caution, care, and diligence, but also a special measure of patience with each other as we struggle over the manifold implications that uh, can easily be drawn from it. But I'm also convinced that as, uh, as difficult as the subject may be, it is equally or even more important for us to study it. Martin Luther, for example, when he was engaged in the uh, leadership of the Protestant Reformation, of course focused his teaching on the central issue of that time, the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And Luther said of that doctrine, namely justification by faith alone, that it is the article upon which the church stands or falls. That is, he was trying to underscore as emphatically as he knew how the importance of the doctrine of justification to the Christian faith. When it came, however, to the doctrine of predestination or the doctrine of election, Luther had this to say, the doctrine of election is the core ecclesia, the heart of the church. In fact, when he engaged in debate with Erasmus of Rotterdam on the subject of election and predestination, he thanked Erasmus, who uh, obviously disagreed with Luther on the matter, he thanked Erasmus that Erasmus had not pestered Luther on trivial matters, but that he had uh, undertaken to debate on matters that go to the very heart of the Christian faith. And so what I'm suggesting is, is that this doctrine of predestination is not a peripheral, tangential, secondary matter of concern for biblical Christianity. Now, as soon as I say that, I realize that in the popular understanding of our culture, we hear statements frequently like uh, the following two statements. One, that the Bible doesn't teach predestination, and two, that nobody in this day and age believes the doctrine anyway. I'd like to speak to both of those popular statements that I regard as erroneous statements and misconceptions and take them uh, by looking at the second one first because it's the easier of the two to refute the statement that nobody believes uh, in predestination anymore. Let me refute it with a simple syllogism. The syllogism goes like this, I am a buddy, okay? I believe in predestination, therefore somebody does believe in predestination. And if I am the last in the world to do so, I apologize for my obstinacy and uh, my being so passe and out of date, but as long as I'm breathing and living, we, it is simply not true to say nobody believes in predestination because I most certainly do. And of course I'm being facetious because 
I'm not into the Elijah syndrome where I have to say, I, I alone am left. Uh, there are tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of Christians in the world today who still believe in predestination. And I think the chief reason for that is the refutation of the first premise that I mentioned a moment ago, the statement that the Bible doesn't teach it. The reason I'm convinced that millions of Christians still ascribe and adhere to the doctrine of predestination is because the Bible teaches it. And I might add, the Bible teaches it clearly and unambiguously. So clearly and unambiguously, dear friends, that virtually every denomination in church history that has taken the time to articulate their confession of faith, to, to write a creed of their beliefs, have been constrained to confess some statement about predestination. What I'm saying simply is virtually every church has a doctrine of predestination. Now, not all of those churches agree on the meaning of the doctrine of predestination or the extent of the doctrine of predestination or how the doctrine of predestination touches people's lives where they live, but because the Bible so clearly speaks about it, every Christian church has been uh, constrained to say something in their creedal statements uh, regarding predestination. So let's just take a moment to read a couple of statements that may be of interest to you from church history. First of all, from the uh, classical expression of faith that came from in the early days, the formula, formative days of the Church of England, their classical uh, confession being the 39 Articles of the Church of England and of the Episcopal Churches. It says this, predestination to life is the everlasting purpose of God whereby, and then in parentheses, before the foundation of the world was laid, end of parentheses, he hath constantly decreed by his counsel secret to us to deliver from curse and damnation those whom he hath chosen in Christ out of mankind and to bring them by Christ to everlasting salvation as vessels made to honor. Here the Church of England professed faith in a predestination that was unto life and was by God's eternal secret counsel and decree designed to bring the elect to Christ as vessels of honor. Here's another one from the 17th century, from 1689. We read this statement, Those of mankind who are predestined unto life, God, before the foundation of the world was laid, according to His eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of His will, hath chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory out of His mere free grace and love, comma, without any other thing in the creature as a condition or cause moving Him thereunto. Well, that surely must have come from the Westminster Confession of Faith or the Helvetic uh, Confession or the Belgic Confession or some other Presbyterian and Reformed uh, tradition, maybe from the pen of John Calvin. No, this comes historically from the Baptist Confession of Faith of 1689, a statement uh, uh, articulating the doctrine of predestination in terms uh, uh, so precise and concise that would have uh, delighted uh, John Calvin in his most sanguine moments. But again, I say, why are these churches and other churches uh, making such a confession regarding predestination? Because predestination is not something invented by Luther or invented by St. Augustine or contrived by John Calvin or Jonathan Edwards or any of the others whose names are so 
often associated with the doctrine but because this doctrine comes to us patently from the pen of the Apostle Paul. Let me direct your attention to a moment, or a moment, to Paul's letter to the Ephesians in the first chapter where Paul, in giving his greetings to the saints at Ephesus, says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed upon us in the Beloved. Verse 11, also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to His purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will. Now, I want everyone to know that in the 16th century, people like Beza and Calvin and Knox and Zwingli and Luther didn't run back into the text of Ephesians and stick that word predestination in there. That word was in there from the beginning. And the word in the Greek pro oritzo means to foreordain, to choose in advance, or as we say in English, to predestine. Now, we all know what the word destination means or destiny. When we're about to take a trip, uh, we may go to the travel agent and ask uh, to buy some tickets for uh, an airplane or the train or the ship or whatever, and obviously the, the agent has to know what. What is your destination? That is, where are you going? What is the terminus point toward which you are heading? Now, what the concept of predestination means is that our destiny, our destination in some sense has been decided in advance, predestination. And it, as we read in these confessions, is simply a reflection of what the Apostle is telling us in Ephesians, that the pre, the reference point of the pre, is defined biblically as being from the foundation of the world. That before the world was created, God had a plan. And that plan, according to His secret counsel and according to the good pleasure of His will, He made a decision to do something, a sovereign decision to do something, namely to predestinate something for some reason. And I think we will see clearly that what He predestines are people and what they are predestined unto or for is, as we are told here in the Scripture, adoption in the Beloved in Christ. That we are predestined in Christ unto salvation. That if you are a Christian before you were ever born, before your mother was born, before your father was born, before Adam and Eve were made, God determined from all eternity your destiny in Christ, that you have been chosen in the Beloved unto salvation, and that you are His craftsmanship unto eternal life. 
Now, if that is true, that is an extraordinary matter. And a matter that, again, may be very perplexing, but I would think would be the cause of great rejoicing among Christians who understand that God's grace is so powerful, that God's grace extends back so far into time, that in the sovereign Creator's plan for the ages, He determined to shed His grace on you, to prepare a place for you in heaven. The New Testament speaks of the time when God will say, come, or when Jesus said, well, come, my beloved, inherit the kingdom which the Father has prepared for you from the foundation of the world. All right, I haven't said anything controversial yet, really. Uh, again, just about everybody who struggles with the doctrine of predestination understands that predestination is rooted in eternity and that predestination is concerned for personal salvation in Christ and that it is a wonderful thing properly understood. But where it gets sticky, where it gets controversial is when we ask the question, on what basis does God make His choice? How and why and upon what conditions does God determine who will receive this amazing gift of saving grace? Does God potentially predestine everyone to salvation? Or does He only predestine some to salvation? And if so, what about those who aren't predestined to salvation? Do they have no chance, no opportunity, no hope? Uh, I remember once when I was sitting in a seminary classroom and the president of the Presbyterian Seminary was happened to be the lecturer that day, and one of the students raised his hand and said, Dr. So-and-so, do you believe in the doctrine of predestination? Now, this is the president of a Presbyterian seminary who's bound by vow, ordination vow, not only to believe it but to teach it. He reacted as if he were having an allergy attack to the doctrine of predestination, and he said, no, he said, I don't believe that God brings some people kicking and screaming against their will into the kingdom who don't want to be there while at the same time refusing admittance to others who desperately want to enter. So that this professor, I mean, this is a trained, skilled theologian who understood predestination to mean that God coerces and forces some reluctant sinners into His kingdom and arbitrarily refuses entrance to others who so much want to be there. What a horrible caricature of the Presbyterian and Reformed doctrine of predestination. But let's take a moment and look at some of the cardinal features of the different approaches to the doctrine of predestination. The doctrine found its earliest point of theological debate in the fourth century when a monk in the Roman Catholic Church took issue with the bishop of Hippo, the great, and perhaps the greatest, certainly the greatest theologian of the first millennium of, of church history, Aurelius Augustine. This uh, monk, whose name was Pelagius, and we'll put his name up here, we want to always remember Pelagius' name. Pelagius responded in outrage to a statement that Augustine had made. And that statement that Augustine had made and had taught was this. It was in a prayer, really. Augustine had written, God commandest what thou wilt and grant what thou commandest. 
Command us what thou wilt, and grant what thou commandest. And what Pelagius didn't like about that was that it seemed to suggest that God required from people something that they wouldn't be able to do unless God gave them extra grace to make it possible. Well, this I have to say for Pelagius. He understood exactly what Augustine was saying. Augustine was in fact saying, yes, O oh God, I cannot do what you require me and command me to do unless you intervene somehow and give me the power to do it. The Bible says of man in his fallen condition that he's dead in sin and trespasses and that he's by nature a child of wrath since the fall in Adam and goes on to say that the natural man is at enmity with God and he doesn't obey the law of God, neither can he obey the law of God. Jesus teaching in, re in debating with the Pharisees on the extent of the fallenness of the human race, made this extraordinary comment, no man can come to me unless it is given to him by the Father. Well, let's look at that for a minute. No man can come to me. This term, no man, if we would set that in a propositional phrase and apply the rules of logic and the rules of immediate inference to it, we would immediately identify the statement, no man, as a universal negative. All men would be a universal affirmative. No man is a universal negative. Now, no man what? No man can. Now, the word can there translates the Greek word that means to be able. Now, ladies and gentlemen, many of us have made the simple mistake frequently in the English language confusing two words, may and can. When I was a kid and I would raise my head, hand and the teacher would say, yes, R.C., and I said, can I sharpen my pencil? And she would always answer the same way, I'm sure you can. <laughs> and I said, yes, ma'am, may I sharpen my pencil? Uh, she was trying to drill into us the difference between may, which talks about permission, and can, which describes ability or power. Now, Jesus is not saying here that no one is allowed or permitted to come to me unless it's given to him the Father. He's talking about ability. No man can. Now, our Lord in that teaching put a universal negative limitation on human ability. There's something, at least one thing, that nobody can do. What? Unless something else happens. Unless a necessary precondition is met. Now, what is it? No man can come to me, Jesus said. Now, let's go back to this debate between Pelagius and Augustine. Does God command all men everywhere to come to Jesus? Is it man's moral obligation to come to Jesus? Yes. But in and of themselves, without some kind of help from God, unless God gives it to them somehow, can't do it. So there we find Exhibit A of what Augustine was talking about. Grant what thou commandest. Command what thou will. 
no one of us has the moral power and ability to be perfect since we are fallen. Yet we are commanded to be perfect. But that command can never, ever be satisfied unless God does something gracious to make it possible. No man can come to me, Jesus said, unless. That unless points to the absolute necessity of God's work of grace in us before we will ever come to Jesus. Jesus spelled it out a different way to Nicodemus when he said, when he said this, unless a man is born of the Spirit, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless he's born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do you see that word unless again? Unless A takes place, B cannot follow. A is a necessary condition for B to happen. You can't have B without A. And this is what uh, this uh, Pharisee couldn't understand. And Jesus said, hey, you have to be born again before you can even see the kingdom of God, let alone enter the kingdom of God. This is why people like Augustine, people like Luther, people like Calvin, people like Edwards, and I keep citing these giants of the faith for a reason. I know that people struggle with the, with the classical doctrine of predestination. And I don't think Christians struggle enough with it. And it certainly is possible that Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Martin Luther, Calvin Edwards, who are virtually universally regarded as the most gifted and brilliant teachers that God has given His church since the end of the apostolic age, and that those five men do not agree with each other on every single point of doctrine. That's obvious. But when they all five agree on one point, they could all be wrong. We don't carry any brief for the inspiration or the infallibility of any of those men individually or all of them collectively, but I'll tell you what. Before I disagree theologically on a, with a point that Aquinas, Augustine, Calvin, Luther, and Edwards all agree on, I'm going to do it in fear and trembling, and I'm going to do my homework beforehand. And, and, and I put that for your consideration, that something, that, I mean, they could all be wrong, but it's unlikely, folks. But all five of them understood this that regeneration, the work of the Holy Spirit, changing the disposition of the human heart, which is a work that God does, and God alone does, must take place before anyone will ever come to faith. That all of those men agreed, even Aquinas, that regeneration precedes faith. And they also all agreed that all who are regenerate come to faith. And they also agreed that the grace of regeneration is what Aquinas calls operative grace, not cooperative grace, but operative grace, a grace that works. That when God sheds His grace of regeneration in the heart of man for the purpose of bringing that man or woman to faith, it works. It does what it is designed to do. That those who are quickened are indeed made alive. As Paul says in the second chapter of Ephesians, and you who were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working, in the sons of disobedience. Among them we do to all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, 
being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, quickened us together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with Him in high places and so on. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What is at issue in the doctrine of, of predestination is not ultimately the debate between God's sovereignty and human free will. The ultimate issue here is the central focus of the matter of God's saving grace. And a grace that is given on the basis of human merit is not grace. A grace that is dispensed on the basis of human works, if the human works are the ground of that, is not grace. And certainly there'd be nothing amazing about it. But the amazing thing about grace is that it is altogether gracious. Now the difficulty is that the Bible is saying that there is a kind of grace that God gives to people to save them, to bring them to faith in Jesus that He doesn't give to everybody. God does not elect everybody. And that's where the stumbling point is, isn't it? One of the things is, it seems like it's undemocratic, it's un-American. Uh, God is not an equal opportunity Savior. We somehow want God to treat everybody equally, and if He doesn't treat everybody equally, He's not treating everybody fairly. Well, even a cursory reading of the Bible will demonstrate to anyone that God doesn't treat everybody equally. God comes to Abraham in the midst of his paganism and appears to him in a miraculous way, reveals himself to Abraham in a way that he didn't do to the Pharaoh of Egypt or Hammurabi. Jesus had enemies in the New Testament, people like Caiaphas, people like Pontius Pilate who pronounced his death sentence. Jesus prayed for their forgiveness because they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't recognize Him for who He was. And the apostles tell us that had they recognized Him for who He was, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. They were responsible to have recognized Him. God had given enough uh, information in Scripture and through the testimony of Jesus' own works that they should have recognized Him, but the fact remains they didn't. And so what happens, if you remember the book of Acts, is that after Jesus died and was raised from the dead, and even after He ascended into heaven, God made a special dispensation for the enemies of Jesus, so that one day Caiaphas was walking down the road in Jerusalem, and suddenly Jesus appeared to him, and a bright light overwhelmed him. And a voice spoke in Hebrew to Caiaphas, saying, Caiaphas, Caiaphas, isn't it hard for you to kick against the ox goat? And Caiaphas responded by saying, Who is it, Lord? And Caiaphas, and the voice came to Caiaphas and said, It is Jesus whom you persecute. And then in Acts 72, we read about Pontius Pilate going on a trip to Rome, and while he was crossing the sea, in the middle of the night, Jesus appeared to him on board that ship and said, Pontius, Pontius! And this great light shone round about Pontius Pilate, and there Jesus revealed his true identity. And then it says another man who was breathing out fire and hostility, going from church to church, dragging believers out of their homes and throwing them in the prison and persecuting him, whose name was Saul, got a commission to carry on the persecution in Damascus. And as he was going along the Damascus road, suddenly this bright light, brighter than the noonday sun, appeared, and he heard a voice speaking him in Hebrew, saying, Saul, Saul. Oh, wait a minute. Stop the music. 
What's wrong with the story I just gave you? Saul, this vehement enemy of Christ, became the number one apologist of the Christian faith in all of history, but not before or until the Lord of glory gave him special grace to open his eyes. Grace that God gave to Paul that he did not give to Caiaphas, that he did not give to Pontius Pilate. Do you see what I'm saying? If God treats everybody equally, why didn't he do that for Caiaphas and for Pontius Pilate? Paul never saw that it was a matter of credit to him that he came to saving faith. He saw his own salvation as a matter of extraordinary grace from beginning to end, and so must you, my friend. Do we really mean it when we say, there but for the grace of God go I? Or are we like the Pharisee in the temple that says, Lord, I thank you that I am not like other men. I thank you that I had the good sense, the insight, and the righteousness to make the proper decision when I heard the gospel. See, Pelagius said that grace is a wonderful thing, and grace facilitates faith. Grace facilitates righteousness. That is, it helps it, but it is never necessary. Augustine said that grace and the grace of election is absolutely necessary for anyone to come to faith. Now, those are the two positions, and Pelagius was condemned as a heretic by the church. However, in the dispute, a moderate position emerged that was called semi-Pelagianism. I like to say it was named after Semi-Pelagius, who was Pelagius's cousin, <laughs> and Semi-Pelagius <laughs> lived in, in Florence. No, no, no. Semi-Pelagianism taught this, that man is fallen to such a degree that he can't redeem himself without the assistance of grace. However, what grace does is this, that grace is offered to everybody, but it is still left for the sinner to cooperate with that grace or to reject it. And here's how predestination works, according to semi-Pelagian views, most semi-Pelagian views hold to what is called the prescience view of election or of predestination. It's based on the premise of divine foreknowledge. It goes like this, that from all eternity, from the foundation of the world, God looks down the corridors of time, and He knows in advance who will cooperate with offered grace, and who will reject it. Do we understand that? He knows from the very beginning that if this person here hears the gospel and is offered the grace of salvation, that, if th that this one will say yes and this one will say no. And on the basis of that prescience, pre-knowledge or foreknowledge, God predestines. That is, predestination rests upon God's knowledge in advance of how we will respond to the gospel, of how we respond to the offer of grace. And those whom He knows will say, yes, He elects unto salvation. Those whom He knows will say, no, are passed over. I would say that the vast majority of evangelical Christians in the world today hold that view, or one similar to it, of predestination. They say, this is what predestination is. It's basically God's foreknowledge. And in this, in the final analysis, the decision of whether you are redeemed or are lost is based upon your free will, on the choice that you make. One prominent evangelist has said it this way, God does 99% of what has to be done, 
but he leaves you responsible for that one percent. I've heard two analogies frequently. One is this, that, that man is in serious trouble as a result of his sin, as a result of his fall. He is sick unto death. He is like a man in intensive care in the hospital who most certainly is dying. He has no hope of recovery unless a special miracle drug is offered to him. And that miracle drug indeed that alone can save him is there by his bedside. He is too weak, too sick, too critical to even reach up and help himself to the medicine. Somebody has to pour the medicine on the spoon. Somebody has to come to his bedside. Somebody has to take the spoon with the saving medicine to his very lips. But unless that man opens his mouth to receive it, he will most certainly die. You see. The other analogy is that, that fallen man is like a man who can't swim and he's cast adrift into the ocean. He's, he's gone under twice already. He's going now down under for the third time. His head is already under the water. He's got one arm stretched out, and only the top part of his fingers are above the surface of the water. And unless somebody throws a life preserver, and they better throw it accurately, that preserver has to come right up against his hand. He most certainly will perish forever. And so God throws the life preserver right against his fingers, but if that man doesn't grasp the life preserver on his own strength, he will drown. See, that's not what I find in Scripture. I don't find saving grace being offered to people who are sick unto death in a hospital room. That saving drug is given and administered to a corpse, ladies and gentlemen who is already pronounced dead, who cannot on his own strength even respond to the gospel. What God did for you if you're in Christ is that after you went down the third time and you were stone cold dead at the bottom of the sea, God the Holy Spirit dove into the water, picked you up out of the water, took you up on the shore, and resuscitated to you, you and brought you alive again through the power of His creation. You are a new creation in Christ. And that's grace. But you're still saying, wait a minute. I don't like it. Two things I don't like about it. The thing, number one, I don't like about it at all is that God doesn't do it for everybody. And the other thing I don't like about it at all is that it seems to rest in God's eternal counsel and it has nothing to do with my actions. What does the Bible say? I used to hate this doctrine, and I used to have a sign up in my study when I was a seminary student. I fought it kicking and screaming for five years. I had the sign up in my study. It said, you are not responsible to God, excuse me, you are responsible to God to believe, to preach, and to teach what God says is the truth, not what you want the truth to be. And when I wrestled with this doctrine, I kept coming back to Romans 9 again and again and again, and it was Romans 9 I couldn't escape, where the Apostle Paul writes these words. It is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants, for this is the word of promise, that this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose according to His choice might stand, not because of works, but because of Him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. And as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What? What shall we say then? There's no injustice in God, is there? Isn't it strange that Paul anticipates that protest? I don't think Paul would ever, if Paul were semi-Pelagian, 
i don't think i think a question statement like that, what is there injustice in god would be a waste of apostolic breath one of the things that comforts me that the reformed doctrine of predestination is the biblical one is that the same reactions that the apostle paul got and there's the same reactions that jesus got when he taught the doctrine of the reactions that we get all the time nobody gets mad at the arminian doctrine of predestination Nobody gets mad at the prescient view of predestination, and I'll tell you why. Because the foreknowledge, prescient view of predestination is not an explanation of predestination, ladies and gentlemen. It is the denial of predestination, pure and simple. Because in the final analysis, the decision rests with man. I don't know of any place in Christian doctrine where I'm convinced that humanism has made a deeper inroad than this because it will not take seriously the dimensions of the fall of man that have brought us to the place where we are morally and spiritually dead, and that only the electing grace of God can save us in our spiritual death. In order that God's purpose, according to His choice, not because of works, but because of him who called. Is there any injustice in God? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You see what happens? If the whole world is judged guilty before God, if the whole world is spiritually bankrupt, if the whole world is in, in, in hostility towards God, on, spiritually dead, we have this American idea that if God reaches down and sovereignly, according to the good pleasure of His will, gives grace to some of these people and brings them to life and saves them from hell, that He's now therefore morally obligated to do the same thing for everyone else. And somehow if He doesn't, we will stand and protest and say, that's not fair! No, that's not equal. And what God is doing here is saying very clearly, don't you remember what I taught to you through the, the lips of Moses? I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'm not obligated to be merciful to anybody. If mercy were an obligation, it wouldn't be mercy. It would be justice. And if I want to give my mercy to Jacob and not to Esau, What's unfair about it? What's unjust about it? Now, granted, if God punished Esau and Esau were an innocent man, then there would be injustice. But the biblical doctrine of election, get this point, teaches that some people receive grace, the rest receive justice. No one ever receives injustice from God. Do you understand that? And finally, he said, so then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Every discussion I've ever been in on the doctrine of election and of predestination has come down to this point, folks. On what does it depend in the final analysis? And my Arminian friends, I'm convinced in the final analysis, have to say, it depends on him who wills. Depends on your free will. Depends on your choice that God sees down the corridors of time. That's what it depends on. The decision is yours. How many times have you heard the evangelist say, there's an election going on here. God votes for you. Satan votes against you. And it's a tie. And you have to cast the deciding vote. If you have to cast the deciding vote, ladies and gentlemen, you are destined to hell with no hope because you, in your own strength, unregenerate, 
will never vote for God. Ever. But according to salvation, according to election, yes, there's an election. But only one person votes. The devil doesn't have a vote. There's only one vote that counts. And from the foundation of the world, God cast his ballot with your name on it, if it so be that you are in Christ. So that it depends not on him who runs, not on him who chooses, not on him who wills, but on the sovereign grace of God. I have to be candid. If the Apostle Paul came in this room right now and heard a bunch of theologians arguing about election and salvation, and they were saying they couldn't get past the final point, and they said, Look, we, we're arguing, Apostle, on in the final analysis, what does my salvation depend on, on, on my will or on God's will? Which is it, Paul? Please tell us. Can you think of any way that the Apostle Paul could answer that question more clearly than he just did in that statement? I urge you, my beloved brothers and sisters, that if you find this doctrine distasteful, look at it again. Just got a, a letter from a fellow the other day who said he hated this doctrine. He read my book, Chosen by God, and I was so glad that it was useful to him. He said, I picked it up. I said, I wanted to read it. He said, I wanted to find the flaw so I could refute it. He said, and I wrote it. I took copious notes. I underlined everything. I got the last page, and I said, gee, I couldn't find it. And he said, so what I decided to do, he said, is I decided to read the Bible through from cover to cover three times. He said, and I did. He said, and it seemed like this doctrine was on every page. He said, when I was done with my searching of the Scripture, he said, not only did I embrace the doctrine, but I began to see the beauty of it and to rejoice in it. Oh, beloved, how many times have I heard that testimony from people who have kicked against the ox goad of God's grace? until they saw the sweetness of His mercy and the purity of His power. And so that we humbly confess before us, O oh God, we couldn't in our natural state have possibly turned ourselves to Christ. We had no inclination towards Christ. We were altogether indisposed towards Christ. We were like these people Paul talks of in Ephesians who were dead in sin and trespasses. We walked according to the course of this world, according to the power of the prince of this world, and so on, just like everybody else. But God, who is rich in mercy, quickened us, made us alive brought us into His kingdom, not kicking and screaming against our will, because what His electing grace does is to make us willing and eager to pursue the Christ we formerly hated, to love the Savior we formerly despised, to embrace the truth we previously ran from. That's what predestinating grace is all about. And once we understand that, and once we discover it, we get on our knees and we say, Oh, God, God, <sighs> command what Thou will, and grant what Thou dost command.